Hello and welcome back to the Nasty Metal, a Bruno channel, Guru YouTube, and welcome to another album of the week. This is episode number 156, and today's episode is a spotlight on Forever Free, the 11th studio album from British metal legends Saxon. Originally released through Virgin Records on May 18th of 1992. And since May 18th is two weeks away, this album is going to see its 30th anniversary. So, that uh, I think it's a, a pretty good time anyways to do it now. So, there we go. So, Forever Free, which of course uh, follows up 1990s or 91's Solid Ball of Rock. According to Metal Archives, it says that it was released in 1990 even though there's no really given month or day when uh, Sell a Ball of Rock. However, if you go on to Wikipedia, it actually states that Sell a Ball of Rock was originally released on February of 1991. So, I think uh, Wikipedia might have the correct day there. Uh, which is uh, not, not a complete shock because Metal Archives, I've noticed, have really kind of gotten bad. Uh, at least the people there have gotten really bad about getting dates wrong. So, I'm actually more inclined on believing Wikipedia than uh, Metal Archives there. Anyways, though, uh, I digress. Again, if uh, again Forever Free follows Solid Ball of Rock. So, uh, to get, just get right into it, this, of course, would be the second uh, album in the 90s where at least most of the original members are still intact. Again, Nigel Glockler had, had returned the Saxon uh, for Solid Ball of Rock after being out of the band for a, a pretty much a while there. Because he wasn't on the Destiny album. So this is his... Re was Solid Ball of Rock saw the return of Nigel Glocklear. So with at least uh, the lineup of Bib Byford on vocals, Paul Quinn, Graham Oliver, Nibs Carter. Who of course had debuted on Solid Ball of Rock. And of course here with Nigel Glockler and drums... This is pretty much our lineup here for, of course, again, into Forever Free. And I'll get into uh, more in information around the lineup after Forever Free. So, there we go. Again, we have at least some of the original members with, with of course, Nigel Glockler, who had, pin uh, who had debuted with the band during the Denim and Leather Tour. And then, of course, spanning into the studio album of Power and the Glory. So, there we go. Um, and, of course, again, the Eagle has landed live. So, there we go. There's our lineup here. Uh, the recording sessions for uh, Forever Free took place sometime in early. I'll have to say somewhere, uh, if I'm going to guessing, on on at least when the recording sessions for the sound took place. Since it was recorded in 1992, however, the album was released on May 18th. There's a very good possible guess that it was probably recorded from January to maybe March. Maybe January or February or at least March of 1992. And it was all recorded at least both at the Heyu Studios in Vienna, Austria. Then at the Gem Studio in Boston, Lincolnshire, England. And that's of course uh, with of course producer uh, Hewing Urson. Uh, again, I... Uh, pronounced his name correctly there. Of course, uh, Biff Byford also handling uh, uh, producer's credits here as well. So, there's at least all, at least whatever lineup you have here. Again, you got Reiner Hansel, who is, of course, uh, the auto engineer, who, again, a famous uh, German, again, late famous uh, German uh, producer and engineer. He's worked with bands like Destruction, Molly Hatchet, and... Uh, so such and such and such, you know, um, guys worked with a lot of fucking German bands and Sodom. So there we go. And that's about it. That, that can really can, uh, say, oh yeah, it was mastered at Hey You Studios in LA studio in Blair Woodward. Um, that's all I say in LA. So again, mastering location, uh, recording studio uh, location was Gem Studios, Boston, Lincolnshire, England. So, okay, there we go. I think I pretty much got down as much of what needs to be said here. Uh, also, um, we have a guy named G, or is it Gigi Skulkin, uh, 
again, NASCO, who is, of course, uh, provides the programming and keyboards for the album. Okay, I think I've, I've uh, said about the information for the album uh, enough here. So, there we go. So, the album does get uh, released through Virgin Records on May 18th of 1982. And so, we are pretty much gifted Forever Free. Since 10 songs were laid out for the album, the 10 songs for the album are, of course, uh, beginning with the title track, Hole in the Sky, uh, the uh, cover of uh, Muddy Waters, uh, Just Want to uh, Make Love to You, which, of course, was written by Willie Dixon, Get Down and Dirty, Iron Wheels, One Step Away, Can't Stop Rockin', uh, Night Hunter, Grind, and Cloud Nine. Also, Can't Stop Rockin' is not as easy top cover. Which is great because it's actually not not one of their uh, not one of ZZ Top's best, but this song is actually very very good though by Saxon. Okay, there it is, uh, and of course, just like Saxon, it well it sounds like a Saxon album. It definitely does continue uh, the whatever progress they were actually were get, getting with Solid Ball of Rock, which is basically back on track after flirting so much with the almost very melodic, almost AOR. And very commercial kind of leanings that really kind of began with, uh, some will say Power and the Glory. I say uh, Crusader that really kind of went and bled even more into like Innocence is No Excuse, which I actually like. That's probably the best of at least of the really almost MTV sort of uh, metal era of the of that scene. It's I think the better experiment of that. And of course, uh, Rock, uh, Rock the Nations, which was not a very good album. I know there are some that actually will defend it. I'm not going to defend it. I think it was a very wishy-washy, kind of half-fast, thrown-together kind of album. And I think it, it really kind of felt like that. And that, that, that was what the result was. And of course, The Destiny, which was even more, really more of a venture further into the sort of very melodic AOR rock sort of sound however i actually think it was actually a very well done sort of melodic aor kind of album in a way very kind of uh, it's not metal in any way but it actually does have a very almost well thought out uh structure to it i think it was a more thought out album than compared to rock the nations but it's still far from was si uh, saxon's finest hour but it was still a fine album Solid Ball of Rock was, I believe, the re was the return to a more heavier, sort of more straightforward uh, heavy metal sound. Uh, even though it still kind of floated a little bit with uh, the sort of, I guess, kind of commercial leanings that you really kind of really got with Innocence. It's no excuse in Rock the Nations. However, I think it probably sounded like a much more of a better follow-up to Innocence. It's no excuse than Rock the Nations did. So we were kind of getting back on track here and Forever Free just continues it even further. And you get more and more, a bit more of a, at least classic Saxon's traits on this album. Uh, I mean, it does hit off hot and heavy with uh, the title track. Then of course, into more straight up fret burner that is Hole in the Sky. Uh, the cover of uh, Just Want to Make Love to You, I think is again, kind of, while it may not seem very necessary, at the same time, I think it's kind of trying to get the point across that, yeah, we are at least are remembering our roots of where our sound came from and what uh, paved, what kind of helped uh, take our sound to in a way. You know, with albums like, for example, let's say the debut album or Wheels of Steel, Strong of the Law, and of course, uh, Denim and Leather. You know, it's kind of giving you that sort of uh, a point across that the remembering where those influences came from. So I think that's what I think is why they chose the song, to, at least to cover, because it does kind of give you that. I mean, yes, it, it was made famous by uh, Foghat, but Saxon, I think, really kind of, kind of, again, they were always were kind of a more of a metal version of Foghat in a way. Uh, again, it just continues that. You know where, where their British roots comes from, where their blues roots comes from, every bit of their influences. It's to get that point across. I think it's a very fine cover, but again, it's not very necessary, but I probably can uh, see why they probably would have chosen anyways. So there we go. Then, of course, then uh, we get other, uh, other great sort of rockers on here. Again, like One Step Away, 
uh, Can't Stop Rockin', uh, Night Hunter. Uh, Night Hunter is, uh, along with Cloud9 and Hole in the Sky, is one of the more straight up speed metal songs. Then, of course, Grind. Uh, whereas I would say Grind and uh, Get Down and Dirty are more closer to the kind of uh, ACDC style boogie song, especially for like Get Down and Dirty, which actually sounds more closer to the classic Wheels of Steel, Strong Arm of the Law, and Denim and Leather period kind of songs. This is where it would have fit perfectly on any of those classic three Trinity albums. Again, they are considered the classic Trinity of albums from Saxon. Again, uh, Wheels of Steel, Strong Arm of the Law, and Denim and Leather. So I think Get Down and Dirty kind of would fit uh, uh, not too far off on any of those three. Uh, Grind, on the hand, kind of has that kind of almost ACDC vibe going on to it, but it actually kind of seems to kind of continue the sort of sound of like Solid Ball of Rock, where it kind of has still that 90s feel, almost like Razor's Edge era sort of ACDC kind of sound. So it kind of has that. And again, uh, it, it ends with Cloud9, again, uh, blistering speed, uh, sort of boogie kind of rocker which actually sounds like it couldn't have been not too far off of an album like let's say power on the glory or innocence is no excuse sort of stuff uh it actually sounds kind of like that so there we go but again hole in the sky and uh one step away or night hunter you know these are definitely classic sort of heavy rockers and they all fit perfectly uh, iron wheels however i do need to kind of mention here because this one is probably the more least heavy song on the album. This one actually is not even a very electric-based song. This one is a little more acoustic-based. Now, it might be seen as a ballad. Uh, however, I feel this one is like not like your typical sort of, uh, you know, soft ballad, but more like a very southern bluesy style ballad, where it's, it's more an atmosphere as well. It just has more of a southern tinge to it, but it's very bluesy, but but uh, melodic at the same time. And it just has a nice atmosphere to it, and I think it kind of works in the middle of the album because of it breaks down a little bit because of, and, and not in a bad way. In a way, it kind of breaks up a little bit of the sort of, I wouldn't say momentum, but just in a way it's seen as a breather kind of uh, spot in the album, as I think is the best way to put it. Because when you got rockers, again, from the, the title track up to about uh, Get Down and Dirty, uh, I think this kind of, it works here. Because then it kind of, I think, continues after this into more, a slightly more heavier and more uh, harder, even, again, more harder territory as well. With, again, like One Step Away, Can't Stop Rockin', Night Hunter, Grind, and Cloud Nine. It really kind of breaks up a little bit of the halves of the album where it's like you got the more... Again, more straightforward, almost hard rocking uh, portion of the album, where the next one is a little bit more towards the metallic portion of the album. So I think uh, Iron Wheels kind of is like the space bar between that, and it's a really good breather. And I think uh, it gives a really good break to at least the listener and everything, so it works in, in, in its advantage, in my opinion. So there we go. Uh, either way... Uh, there's really not a bad song on this album for me. Every one of this is still top-notch. Uh, whether or not I think this is a better album than uh, Solid Ball of Rock is, I think, up for debate because of I love Solid Ball of Rock, and I think that's a very good album. This one, I think, is kind of close second, but at the same time, it's this album is almost a a bit of a, a, a transitional album because of there you can hear that they're starting to kind of still continue the more commercial leanings of Solid Ball of Rock, but almost kind of continue in the more slightly more heavier terrain that really would begin a bit with the next album, that being Dogs of War. So that kind of brings up a little bit, bit of the topic of Dogs of War in a way. Because that album would be even more uh, different compared to this one. This uh, That album would kind of would bring in some more modern traits that would kind of would continue further into like unleash the beast and even to this day that album i, th I think Dog dogs of war was down that really kind of really even more brought back a lot more of the uh the more heavier spark in a way but i think it's it just went further again with unleash the beast but that's where it brings up the whole uh 
the fact and everything, uh, it brings up a little bit, bit of this information is that Dogs of War ends up being the final album where Graham Oliver would be in Saxon. Because after that, uh, I think there was some sort of issue between Graham Oliver and, of course, Paul Quinn and Biff Byford. And that's, of course, then you get the uh, the Oliver Dawson uh, uh, in, uh, Saxon. And that led a lot of legal issues and everything. But with Graham Oliver on the way, and of course uh, with Doug Skerritt coming into Saxon uh, for the Unleashed in the, in the Beat, you know, Unleashed the Beast album, uh, and I, I believe it, it, it just... It introduced a more newer sound for Saxon, and it's a sound that Saxon has been playing off of since Unleashed the Beast from 1997. It just it, they've been playing off that more almost heavier, almost slightly Euro metal sound that they've just been continuing since, and that really uh, you uh, the the signs of that sound were beginning to be heard slightly on here. But even more further on Dogs of War, and then finally it just be even more uh, 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 just manifest manifest itself even more on Unleash the Beast. And since then, they've just never gotten out of that sound. It's just been uh, uh, Saxon's core sound since Unleash the Beast. So there we go. So that's pretty much it for my overall thoughts on Forever Free. So again, this album again uh, was real. Is was released on May 18th of 1992, and again two weeks from now will, will be May 18th of 2022. So 30 years uh, of an uh, pretty much an underrated Saxon album, in my opinion, a very underrated one, and I think one that deserves a bit more recognition because of this is kind of again all the leanings and the beginnings of. The, the almost the evolution of Saxon in the 90s to where again you're going to lead into an album like Unleash the Beast. So there we go. I think that it's just like one of those leaning albums. I think one of those albums that really not, uh, needs to be kind of a bit more loved a bit more and should have been celebrated a bit a bit more because of this is the journey into the more the, the sound that Saxon is going to take up after like Dogs of War, you know, with like Unleash the Beast and everything that, that they are still continuing with. This is again, just that journey into that. So I think it deserves a bit more respect and a, a bit more celebration. So there we go. That's why I chose to spotlight it for the channel here. So there we go. Again, uh, if you were there when the album was released and you have any sort of, let's say, thoughts or, or anything, you know, whether it be positive or negative, you can leave them in the comments section below. But if you've never heard Forever Free and you've been very curious about this album, uh, definitely leave, uh, at least check it out. I think it's definitely worth checking out the, of any albums of the 90s when it comes to Saxon. Uh, there really wasn't a bad album at all in the 90s. There really wasn't. But Forever Free, I think, is definitely worth checking out. So there we go. Uh, that's it. I hope all of you enjoyed. This is Heather Thrasher saying out, uh, I'm out. And I'll see you all later. Take care, everyone.